Morlu David, Adonai Roilo et Sar, and Ostashi are the same young men who post in our lady. Now she is Shove, young Kane of the Magdalene said that the man Shmo. Yam Kele, who gets some of us who we were not yet to him with him. She took home in Shantet by him in Akamuni. Harok on I shall call Nagas or Roy. The shout of a shaman Roshi considered by Yab. A tobo chesed here to Puni by Mechayoi. Shaft to the base out of the night of the Yorah Kingdom. So on the day that the Lord is my shepherd, El Shanazayak, God causes me to lie down in lush pastures. God leads me beside tranquil waters. God restores my soul and guides me in righteous paths for God's name's sake. For I walk the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your scepter and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me and fill me with my adversaries. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup will be close. May only goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for length of days. We were a few days to Rosh Hashanah. And one of the great themes of Rosh Hashanah is recognizing Hayom Haras Olam. This is the day, literally, this is the day of the creation of the world. What we really mean is this is the day that man, woman were created. And Rosh Hashanah is very much about hearkening back to those days of the creation of human beings and thinking about the godliness that was placed within Adam and Kava, Adam and Eve, in the outset of the world. And we try to recapture that godliness. Sometimes it's not so easy to look at a person and think of the godliness within them. But every now and then you meet a person and it's just so apparent. But Selim El Kim, the likeness of God, the uniquely special person in your presence, it's just clear. And I always felt that David Stern, Menachem David Ben Yaakov Ben Yamin, was such a person. David was brilliant. And he applied his intelligence to so many subjects. But one of the subjects that he applied his intelligence to was the study of Torah. And I had a great, great schuss, I had a great privilege. For years, David would attend an early morning Gemara Shir that I would give. I frequently would be a late attendee to that early morning Gemara Shir. But David was always there, always waiting. And to be very candid, if it was time for the shear to begin and David wasn't present, it was obvious he wasn't coming that day. Because if David was coming, he would be there ready and waiting. David and I didn't always agree about the meaning of a line of Gemara. He was an intelligent, probing mind. So there's no way that a person who's really thinking about it would always agree with how things were presented. That's not surprising. That's very normal. When you give shiwa, when you give classes, not everyone agrees. People have questions, people have other ideas. What was remarkable about David was the way he would disagree. It was very clear, it was always, always very respectful of everyone in all of his interactions, that was clear. But he had a strong idea in his mind, but he was absolutely ready to listen to the other argument. It sounds basic, but anyone who has experience, I think in any kind of intelligent discussion on any subject, you don't find it that much. People come, people have their idea, and they try to argue their idea as best they can. David wasn't giving up easy, but he was very interested in understanding the other's perspective. You know, something I'd always appreciated so much about him, which meant that the pursuit of knowledge, I'm sure it wasn't only in this, in this study, and I'm sure it wasn't only in the study of Torah, the pursuit in knowledge was about just that, not about winning, not about impressing people. I can't tell you how many times over these past years 
I thought how much of a tragedy it was that due to his stroke, he wasn't in the position to pursue knowledge in the same way that he had before. That it was so difficult for him to concentrate on things for extended periods of time. It was difficult for him, he of course was able to speak, thank God, but it was difficult for him to find the words that would express the eloquence that were in his mind. We don't understand the ways of Hashem. But it, I frequently thought to myself how difficult it is to see such a person constrained in such a way. But there was another aspect of David that I knew wasn't only brilliant. He was such a beautiful, gentle soul. And we already mentioned, mesh look at all of his interactions. I didn't keep in touch remotely well enough over the years that he was homebound. And I want to publicly ask Mechila to thank you for that. But the few times, way too few, way too far between, that I did reach out. If I would leave a phone message, for example, I would always receive such a warm email in response. Thank you so much for finding the time to think of him and to reach out to him. And when he was well, I was struck by his gentle, beautiful nature. And though he wasn't able to express his great intelligence in the way he was used to before his stroke, I had great admiration for that beautiful nature that remained in my perspective even after his stroke. Sometimes we think to myself, obviously, everyone is complex, but I sometimes would think to himself that he was the most beautiful fusion of his two very special parents. Especially now that we reunited with such a brilliant person. And his mother, who should be well, such a remarkably sweet person. And of course, his mother was also brilliant, and his father was also sweet, but what stood out about them, in my mind at least, were these two things. I felt that David was a fusion of both of these things. One nechama, one comfort that I have in my own heart right now, I hope is true for family and friends gathered here, is that now David is going on to open my MS world of truth where so many ideas will be taught and exchanged and he'll be unhindered. He'll be unhindered in his ability to focus. And for such an intelligent soul, in a way, we'll miss him dearly here. But I think there's a Lachama that he's going there. If I could just say for a moment, we're all supposed to learn things from each other. Judy, I've marveled at your devotion to David for years in a very, very challenging circumstance. Very challenging. Always there, always devoted, always doing your utmost to put a positive smile on things. And I'll just say, I personally have learned a great deal from you. And in May God always look over him and bless him. And again, I do want to publicly ask Machila for anyone present. We have been present, myself certainly included, would have liked to reach out to you or David. I'm sorry that we didn't do so. And he's got a few words. I'm David Wiener, Judy's brother. When you're gathered here from close and far, to say our covered 
that the available is going to send David soon. We recall so well when David married Judy. They complimented each other so well. Our parents were so happy with him and with the sons joining our family. David was very talented, especially at woodwork. He chose various mitzvahs and created beautiful, exquisite items, bookcases for the shul, tesla boxes, color face. Is that Kaylee beyond faith? This is my God, and I will beautify him and his mitzvahs. David was so proud of the son of God. He was so proud of his children, Sheila and Adam, Moshe and Adam. And the Shem granted him the opportunity to even greet and meet his grandchildren, the next generation. David and Judy were a source of great joy and Nagas, his parents, Jerry and his parents. David recognized so graciously the importance of Judy pursuing and developing her career even up to this very end. When our parents, Rabbi Jacob and Guru Rina, retired, they chose to move to Silver Spring here to be near to David and Judy. David was always so sensitive to the feelings of others. And also the situation. Thus, he understood that Judy would be spending time with her parents as they aged, and he accepted it so very graciously. In all these years, we never heard him get or not settled in. He did not want to impose himself on others. Even after his stroke to, to accept the great poem. We take this opportunity to, to thank Hashem for bringing David into this world. We take this opportunity to thank Hashem for giving David to Judy as a spouse for 41 wonderful years. We take this opportunity to thank Hashem for allowing David and Judy to produce and raise two lovely children Shira and Moshe. Thank you to all of you who came, especially from far away, especially to David, sister Yudi from Albany, and her children from Boston and Pittsburgh, and to Uncle Gordon from Westchester, and to my children from Lakewood. We take this opportunity to thank Gabby Rosenbaum for guiding us and for being there always when needed. We thank all the friends and families, especially the Putin, for helping out, especially when things got tough. We thank the Tehillim group for saying Tehillim every Wednesday as a swift potato. We thank Yitzhak Zimmerman for being David Sabusa, close friend and confidant for over four decades. Most of all, we thank Judy for being so strong, for supporting and caring for David during these past challenging times. David always supported Judy during her medical challenges and was most appreciative of the way Judy supported him. We take this opportunity on behalf of Judy and the children and the whole family to ask and feel if we in any way offended David over these many years. May David find comfort in Ghanaian and may the Kodesh Baruch Hu grant comfort to us who are left behind. May David be a Yemelis Yosha for all of us and may the new year bring the Chans, the Shuvah Solis and the Shuvahs the whole of the father is gone. Here is the room.
In this case, um, one feels compelled to this and feel at the beginning. And I'm afraid that some of the things I'm going to say would be a violation of the confidence in this in me. But it is the Kabbalah of the uh, not allegation. I grew up in Rochester, the Polish, Jerry, and so so Jerry was a Hebrew scholar. At day school principal. And so he was an early child of education. And it's school to be in relation to the things that he was doing. So, you should know. He loved to pick up about the read when he was a child. We've heard him in many stories, but there's just two that I want to uh, say I remember. One was that apparently the city of Rochester's department of public works came around and put signs on trees that needed to be removed. The contractor was going to come in with. No trees, but they don't love trees. So, so efficiently, after the city put up the signs, they would have looked this way and that and then take the sign down. Um, and he notices he didn't want to make a big show of it. He didn't want to make a show of it. Sorry. Not because he was appointed to avoid responsibility, because he was doing something. In his young mind, that was responsible and expressing love for the environment, and he didn't want any credit for it. What he thought he was doing was really good. Um, Sue told me a story where uh, she had recommended, recommended the family book, and um, I don't know what offense the family did have committed, but she recommended the family book. And you heard the read a few minutes later talking to Danny Gay, saying, Don't worry, Tico. You really didn't mean it. <laughs> so you hear the gentleness of his character and the quality of goodness and compassion that filled his very being. Following Jerry's example, and this was the family of Black people. And this was also a family that spent a year in Israel in 1960. And since Dean was very young, he was able to pick up Hebrew in a way that young people can pick it up, that older individuals have some difficulty with. Um, and uh, after he graduated high school, in Michigan, which is where the family had moved to, following Jay's appointment at the Jay School Principal in School in Toronto. David spent his first year of college at Hebrew University and he followed the courses in Hebrew. He never let on that he was trans and he really didn't want anyone to think he was anything special. But a clue was how he laying the university rule of life. His landing was 
fluent and melodious and natural. And I still had it in my mind how it used to lay. It was among a number of volunteers who named at University Boulevard. Another thing he did at University Boulevard was he used his handyman skills, but he did it on the condition that no one knows that he did it. Um, he fixed all sorts of things. And he had a group of people who fixed all sorts of things. But I'm not sure that all the fixers knew that the beat was not a fixer. Because he was private and he didn't seek attention, he didn't seek any sort of approbation. I think maybe what that says about a person is that he's very secure, he knows who he is, you know, who, who he isn't. Um, but he obviously grew up with this idea that it's not proper to boast, it's not proper to be showy, it's not proper to put yourself out there on a big deal. He really wasn't a big deal. But he didn't really want attention. He wanted a quiet life. He wanted his space. And then Judy gave him that space. I guess he gave Judy that space. Um, among his um, hobbies was acoustic guitar. And he loved folk music. And he loved. Um, Rock music, and he loved the lyrics. And I remember one of the songs that was his favorite was one that was written by Ray Nash, and it was Simple Man. And the lyrics, when she sung with such emotion, I think expressed his love for June. This is his song that made him think of Judy. Um, the lyrics are very complicated, as is the case with many poetic writings. But among them was I have never been so much in love. I just want to hold you, I don't want to hold you down. But he told me on innumerable occasions before he came that she was his wife. And he was sure that he was her, but he didn't say that. Is woodworking skills were not only for himself, it's not only for his own gratification. He did intricate work with a jigsaw and he presented many, many, many wedding gifts, Shabbat gifts, engagement gifts. He obviously was gratified by his hobby. But he gave it away. He gave it to people he liked. He gave it to people who invited him. And you know, it's a lot more meaningful than a check. Um, people had in their dining room wedding gifts that were made by the lead. He was a man of great physical vitality. He was unbeatable at racquetball. And I used to be amazed that he would take a kayak or a canoe and put it on top of his car with no assistance. If you offered assistance, he would say, I will make it harder. <laughs> Was able to balance it, and he was, he was able to hoist it on top of his car. And said, How did you do that? His attitude was, it was really nothing. You know, it's not really nothing. In 
learning he asked some great questions. I remember how we would go early in the morning to Rabbi Rosenbaum's shielding. And I remember how much he loved that. Um, and I remember um, how long it took us to get through the Sechet Brachot. And we were sure that we hadn't even scratched the surface. We love hearing Kuzuri more recently, and a book that was about applying a lot of principles to modern issues that were political issues, social issues, maybe a medical issue. Um, but it was this mind of his that had this need to discover how do the rabbis who lived in the age of the Mishnah inform our thinking about what's going on at Johns Hopkins University this afternoon. It's halacha not in a vacuum, halacha in daily use. Halacha that gets meaning to our lives and is not something for the bookshelf. You never stop finishing it. He thought you were the most resourceful, the most helpful, the most wise life a man could have. And he didn't know how to give himself a question to the country. I am again. I hope you know that. Mm -hmm. I hope you told you. I'm telling you the best of me. Of course, of Moshe is Eagle Scout. Moshe took on very dangerous work in recent times. Thank God, is now in a more stable environment. And he was filled with Abby. And he always spoke about Shira. And he said, My word wants to learn Yiddish. You were a skilled student learning Yiddish during what, what speaks to yourself. You had a great deal of respect for Adam. You loved receiving pictures from his grandchildren, Meira and Talia and Yaakov Yitra. And you love more when you visited. Um, the conversation there to visits were much more animated. You know, when an illness goes to the heart of who you are, it causes a tremendous emotional disconnect. If you can put a canoe or a kayak on top of your car, if you can do woodwork, if you can play racquetball, and one morning in December of 2020, you wake up and your body isn't working, I guess the first thing you think is, well, okay, I'm having a bad day, you go away. And I went away. And this course, let's say, tremendous. And yet, he wanted to advance. He wanted to continue to see was it possible to regain function? He went to physical therapy as recently, I think, it was about 10 days ago. So, what does this all mean? Why should he have had to spend two years and ten months struggling to return to who he was? Why did he 
this portion is happening right here. And the first kind of alloy is the English bell clock. And we say Psalm 127. Um, and it's a little bit dramatic the first day, but as the days go on, we have a show. We have a show for them this morning. We do the same thing. You guys have been on the first day of that But an event like this, when someone is taken from us, some of them we can understand. Some of them seem to judge. That is a very bad show for the world. And I think it begs us to consider are we doing everything we can to fully reach our potential? If we like tennis, shouldn't we be getting on the phone to our tennis partner? And shouldn't we be reserving a court for this afternoon? If we like learning, shouldn't we open up for tomorrow? The show that we have heard today tells us to maximize every moment of our lives. Because that's what the being needs to do. He maximize every moment of his life. His creativity, his energy, his wisdom. If you know what you need. Made him a human being of such stature that all of us can be inspired by this example. And though we are filled with sins, we also can be going to be happy that we have the occasion to be his friend, to have him in our community. He kicks things in the shoe without anyone knowing that to listen to his learning to go community. One must stand there as we might, because if we did not look at all events of misfortune and come away with some positive lesson, life would be impossible to live.
until Friday afternoon, Shiva will end with Rosh Hashanah. Um, Mincha this evening will be 7.05. Shacharis on Wednesday and Thursday mornings will be at 6.30. There will not be Shiva Minyanim in the house on Friday. Paul Bears will please come forward.